بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وی بگن ٹو ڈیز پروگرام ود دراط دا ریسٹیشن فرام دی ہولی قرآن بائی بردر اشرف محمدی اعوذ باللہ من الشیخان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قد افلح المؤمنون الذین هم فی صلاتهم خاشعون والذین هم عن اللغو معرضون والذین هم للزكاة فاعلون والذین هم لفروجهم حافظون الا على ازواجهم الا على ازواجهم او ما ملکت ایمانهم فإن هم غير ملومين فمن ابتغى وراء ذلك فأولئك هم العادون والذين هم لأمانتهم وعهدهم راعون والذين هم على صلاتهم يحافظون أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون صدق الله العظيم The translation from Surah Al-Mu'minun, chapter 23, verses 1 to 11. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. The believers must eventually win through those who humble themselves in their prayers, who avoid vain talk. who are active in deeds of charity, who abstain from sex except with those joined to them in the marriage bond or the captives whom their right hands possess, for in their case they are free from blame. But those whose desires exceed those limits are transgressors. Those who faithfully observe their trusts and covenants and who strictly guard their prayers, this will be the heirs who will inherit paradise, they will dwell therein forever. Verily, Allah has spoken the truth. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum, may peace be on you. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, welcome all of you to today's program. The Islamic Research Foundation strives for Islamic Dawa, the proper presentation, clarification and understanding of the message of Islam as well as removing misconceptions about Islam amongst less aware Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Reason, logic and modern scientific understanding are the basis of all its presentations. The IRF office complex has a video cassette library, a publications department, a cable and satellite television production studio, an audio video recording department, and a computer department. It also has a multi-purpose audio visual reading room, an auditorium, a sales outlet called Islamic Dimensions, a ladies wing, and a children's wing. These provide the much needed facilities and services for understanding the overall excellence of Islam and its teachings. The IRF office and its facilities are open from 10 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. daily except Fridays. The regular programs of the Islamic Research Foundation include 
organizing public lectures, followed by open question and answer sessions, symposia, open forum interactions, and such programs, providing more than 3,500 video cassette titles on Islam and comparative religion to the public on free hire for seven days, free distribution of more than 50 publications on Islam on request, distributing the Holy Quran with translation for understanding the message of Allah meant for the whole of humankind, regular interaction internationally on the internet for presenting the message of Islam. The IRF has its own website. Through cable TV network relays in Mumbai alone, the IRF video cassettes on Islam reach more than one million homes for almost three hours daily. The ATN satellite television channel telecasts IRF programs on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays from 6 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. Indian Standard Time across 68 countries of the world. The NEPC satellite TV channel and other TV channels too telecast IRF programs regularly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our striving in his way and grant us more opportunities and will to serve his deen dedicatedly. Ameen. Dr. Zakir Naik is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation. Dr. Zakir has left his medical profession to devote himself wholeheartedly in spreading the truth of Islam as well as removing misconceptions about Islam amongst non-Muslims as well as less aware Muslims, especially through his public talks and TV programs the world over. He is appreciated more so for his convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences and critics at his public talks. Salah is the most important pillar of Islam, after Iman or faith. Salah is the Arabic term for the Muslim prayer which is commonly known as Namaz in Urdu. Today Dr. Zakir will present the Islamic perspective and concept of Salah and its objectives in his talk on Salah, the programming towards righteousness. Brothers and sisters, Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi, wa sahabi ajmain. Amma baad, auz billahi minash shaitanir rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, utlu ma uhiya ilayka minal kitabi, wa akim salata, inna salata, tanha anil fasha evil munkar, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, rabbi shuhali sadri, wa yisilli amri, Wahlul Ugdata Millesani Yafkau Kauli. My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of this morning's talk is Salah. The programming towards righteousness. Most of the people, they translate Salah into English as the prayer. The prayer is not the exact translation of the Arabic word Salah. Because to pray means to beseech, to ask earnestly. Like how you pray or beseech in a court of law. To pray means to supplicate, to ask for help. The dua is the supplication, the prayer. Salah is not merely to pray. It means much more than that. Because in Salah, besides asking for help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we Muslims, we also praise him. We also receive guidance from him. And the Salah simultaneously is a sort of programming. It is a conditioning or in layman's terminology, it is brainwashing. 
But if someone is going to offer salah, and if a person asks him, that where are you going? And if he says he is going for brainwashing, or if he is going for programming, it will sound odd. Therefore, I personally do not mind if people use the word prayer for the Arabic word salah. But they should remember that salah is much more than merely to pray. The moment you hear the word programming, you start thinking of a computer. If you allow me to call the human being a machine, I would say it's the most complicated machine on the face of the earth. It is much more complicated than the most advanced computer in the world. And we human beings, we are the Ashafur Makhluqat, the best of creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Holy Quran says in Atteen, chapter number 95, verse number 4, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحَسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ That verily, we have created the human beings in the best of molds. The psychologists, they tell us that our mind is not directly under our control. The body is directly under our control. If I want to lift my hand, I can lift it. If I want to bring it down, I can bring it down. If I want to take a step forward, I can take it. The body is directly under our control. But the mind is not directly under our control. Therefore, most of us, we might have experienced that while we offer salah, our mind keeps on wandering. And suppose, if a student, after appearing for his examination, if he offers salah, he starts reviewing his examination paper in the salah. He starts thinking, answer I gave to question 2. Instead of this, I should have written that. If a businessman offers salah, he starts thinking, that how much profit have I made today? How much goods did I sell? If a housewife, if she offers salah, she may start thinking that what should I cook for my husband? Should I cook biryani or should I cook pulao? It's very common that during salah, our mind keeps on wandering. Why does the mind wander? The reason is because our mind is empty. And a mind cannot remain empty. Therefore, it wanders. Most of the Muslims, they know the basic things that we recite in our Salah. The Surah Fatiha and the few verses of the Holy Quran or the short surahs of the Holy Quran which we recite in the Salah. We Muslims, we recite it so mechanically that even if you wake up a Muslim from the middle of his sleep, and ask him to recite Surah Fatiha, he can do it 100 miles per hour. It's mechanical. And because it is mechanical, only a minute portion of a mind is utilized in reciting the mechanical portion, which we know by heart. That is Surah Fatiha and the other verses of the Holy Quran. Most of us Muslims, since we are non-Arabs, we don't understand Arabic as a language. And because we don't understand what we are reciting in our Salah, there are high possibilities of our mind wandering. Therefore, to prevent our mind from wandering, we should recite the Arabic portion and simultaneously recall the meaning of the things you are reciting in the Salah. If you know English, recall the English translation. If you know Urdu, recall the Urdu translation. If you know Hindi, recall it in Hindi. If you know Marathi, recall it in Marathi. If you know Gujarati, recall it in Gujarati. Recall the meaning of the things you are reciting in the language you understand best. For example, 
when we recite Surah Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Most merciful, most gracious. Maliki Yawmid Deen. The master of the day of judgment. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'een. Thee alone we worship, thee alone we ask for help. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Show us the straight path. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim, ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim, walad dalleen. The path of those who have earned high in favor. And of those whose path is not wrought, nor who go astray. When we recite the Surah Fatiha or the other verses in Arabic, simultaneously recall the meaning and your mind will not wander. Because again your mind is occupied in recalling the meaning of the Arabic portion that you are reciting in your Salah. But after a few weeks or few months, even this becomes mechanical. Your mind is very powerful. You recite the Arabic portion and recall the meaning because the mind is very powerful and again there are chances your mind will divert. But there are less chances because a little portion of your mind is occupied in reciting the Arabic portion and another portion of your mind is occupied in recalling the meaning. There are less chances it will divert but yet it may wander. To prevent your mind from wandering, Besides reciting the Arabic portion and recalling the meaning, you should even concentrate on what you are reciting and recalling. A human being cannot concentrate 100% on two different things. He can concentrate 50% on two different things or 80%, 20%. But 100% on two different things he can't concentrate. So the more you concentrate, the less your mind will wander. So to prevent your mind from wandering, you should recite the Arabic portion, recall its meaning and concentrate on the meaning. Then inshallah, your mind will not wander. I start my talk by quoting a verse from the Holy Quran, from Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 45, which says, Utlu ma uhiya ilayka min al-kitabi wa salata. Inna salata tanha anil fasha evil munkar. Which means recite of what we have sent by inspiration of the book to thee. And establish regular prayers. For verily, prayers restrain you from shameful and unjust deed. The Holy Quran says that salah restrains you from shameful and unjust deed. As I mentioned earlier. Salah is a sort of programming. It's a programming towards righteousness. And we Muslims, we are programmed five times a day in our Salah. And we ask for guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ihdina surat al-mustaqeem. Show us the straight path. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the answers. He programs us towards righteousness. For example, the Imam, after Surah Fatiha, he may recite Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyuhal lazina amun, O you who believe, inna mal khamru al maithiru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal ansabu al azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishsum min amali shaitan, these are Satan handiwork. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Here we are being programmed in the Salah that you should abstain from intoxicants, from gambling, from idol worship, from fortune telling, because these are Satan's handiwork. The Imam, he may recite after Surah Fatiha, Surah Maida. Chapter number 5, verse number 3, which says, Hurrimat alaykumul maitudu waddamu walahmul khinzir. 
وما هو الا لي غير الا بي فوربن فو يو فو فودا ديد ميت بلاد ذا فلاش اوف سوين اند اني فود اون ويتش اني نيم بيسايد الله هاز بين ووكد يو وي ار بين بروجرامد ان ذا صلاه ذات ذا فود ذات يو شود نيفر هاف ذا فوربن فودز ار ديد ميت بلاد ذا فلاش اوف سوين and any food on which any name besides allah has been invoked on it we are being programmed towards righteousness the imam after surah fatiha he made said surah al isra chapter 17 verse number 23 24 which says that allah subhanahu wa taala has ordained for you that you worship none but him and that you be kind to your parents and if any one of them or both of them reach old age do not say a word of contempt don't even say off to them but address them with humility and lower your wing of kindness to them and pray to the lord that have mercy on them as they cherished me in childhood we are being programmed that we have to be good to your parents and if any one of them or both of them reach old age yet you should not even say off to them we have been programmed in our salah the computer normally requires programming only once but since the human mind has a free will of its own which the computer doesn't have the human beings have to be programmed regularly because the amount of wrong things we see around us in the society like is teasing bribing cheating robbing alcoholism drug addiction molestation there are high chances that our mind can get deprogrammed therefore we have to be kept on being regularly programmed to keep us on the sirat al mustaqim on the straight path some people may ask that why don't you offer salah only once why offer five times a day for a healthy body a human being requires minimum three meals a day if he has one meal a day he will not have a very healthy body similarly for a spiritual soul a human being requires minimum five times of programming five times of salah one is not sufficient that's the reason we muslims we offer salah five times a day the jews they offer prayers three times a day which is also mentioned in the old testament in the book of daniel chapter number 6 verse number 10 we muslims we offer minimum 5 times salah every day and it's a commandment of allah subhanahu wa taala which has been given to all the muslims and it's mentioned in the holy quran in surah hud chapter number 11 verse number 114 in surah isra chapter 17 verse number 78 in surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 130 and surah rum chapter number 30 verse number 17 and 18 these few words of the holy quran they instruct the muslims to offer salah five times a day the five daily salahs which we muslims should offer are the fajr salah which begins from any time between the break of dawn till just before sunrise the second is the zuhar salah after the sun reaches its highest point from the decline of the sun till the midpoint between noon and sunset third is the asar salah after the zuhar salah ends until just before sunset the fourth is the maghrib salah immediately after sunset till the end of twilight and isha salah immediately after twilight it can be offered till the beginning of dawn but it is preferable to be offered before 12 in the midnight 
a Muslim should offer Salah minimum five times a day. And when we offer Salah, and before we enter the mosque, we Muslims, we remove our footwear. And this was the same commandment which was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Musa alayhi salam, Moses peace be upon him, which is mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 11 and 12. When he approached the fire, he heard a voice, O Moses, verily I am thy Lord. Put off thy shoes, for thou art in the sacred valley of Tua. This was the commandment given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Musa alayhi salam. A similar message is mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, chapter number 3, verse number 5. It says, He, Lord Almighty, says to Moses, Draw not nigh hither, take off thy shoes from thy feet, for thou art on sacred grounds. A similar message is repeated in the book of Acts, chapter number 7, verse number 33. The Lord tells to Moses, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for thou art on sacred grounds. And we Muslims, we are even given the option to wear the shoes when we enter the mosque or when we offer salah by our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our beloved Prophet said, but when you wear the shoes, the soul should be clean. And it's mentioned in Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the book of Salah, Kitab Salah, chapter number 240, hadith number 652, the Prophet said, Be different than the Jews, for they always, during prayer, remove their shoes or sandals. It's also mentioned in Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the Kitab salah chapter number 240, hadith number 653, that Amr bin Shweb, on the authority of his father, said that his grandfather said, I saw the Prophet pray both barefooted and with sandals. The reason we Muslims, we take off our shoes before we enter the mosque or for salah or clean the soles of our shoes is because we are hygienic people. We want to keep our place of worship clean. Before we offer salah, there is a call for prayers. And in different religions, you have different ways of calling people to come to prayer. For example, the Jews, they use the trumpet, as it's mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, chapter number 10, verses 1 to 3, Lord spake to Moses and told him to make two trumpets of silver and to use it to call the assembly. The Christians, they use the church bell. Some tribes, they use the drum. In Islam, we use the human voice. And the call for prayer is called as Adhan. And the person who gives the Adhan is called a Muaddin. The human voice is much more melodious and soothing as compared to the trumpet, bell or drum. And there is a much better impact on the human being. There are many non-Muslims who have reverted to Islam only by hearing the Adhan. They were so impressed with the melodious Adhan which had a tremendous effect on their heart, mind and soul that they accepted Islam. But unfortunately, all the Adhan that we have in Bombay they aren't as melodious as they should be. And they cause more inconvenience to the human beings than tranquility. Therefore, I request all the Muaddin, 
that they should hear the adhan of the Harmain Sharif, Masjid Nabi in Medina and Masjid Haram in Makkah, as an example of what adhan should be like. Besides the adhan being melodious and soothing, it also carries a message. But unfortunately, most of the non-Muslims, they do not know what the message of the adhan is. Last December, I had been to Kerala to attend a conference organized by the Muslims in which they also invited a non-Muslim minister who was giving a talk on the stage and he was speaking a few good words about the Muslims and about Islam and he said that we Indians, we are very proud of the Muslims we are proud of the Mughal rulers the amount of monumental buildings they made the beautiful structures they made no wonder you Muslims you praise Emperor Akbar five times a day it may sound like a joke but it's very common that many non-Muslims think especially of India that we praise Emperor Akbar in the Adhan and in our Salah there are some non-Muslims who are impressed by the Western movies which very often show the actor dressed up in an Arab garb who's a villain, who's a terrorist and before he draws out his sword he says Allahu Akbar so non-Muslims think that Allahu Akbar is a war cry which the Muslims give before killing the non-Muslims it is the duty of every Muslim to clarify these misconceptions from the minds of the non-Muslims and we should give the message of Adhan tell them the translation of the Adhan that when we give the Adhan and when we recite Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar it doesn't mean that we are praising Emperor Akbar or it's a war cry but it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest Almighty God is the greatest Allah is the greatest Allah is the greatest Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah I bear witness that Muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I bear witness that Muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Hayya alayh salah Hayya alayh salah Come for salah Come for salah or come to prayer Come to prayer Hayya alayh salah Hayya alayh salah Come to success Come to success Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allah is the greatest Allah is the greatest La ilaha illallah There is no God but Allah we have to explain the meaning of the Adhan to the non-Muslims. It is the duty of the Muslims that we deliver the message of Islam and explain about it to the non-Muslims. And before we offer Salah, we always have to do ablution that is we have to wash ourselves that is we have to do wudu this is mentioned in the holy quran in surah maida chapter number five verse number six that ya ayyuhal lazina amunu o you who believe when you prepare yourself for salah wash your face and your hands and arms up to the elbow rub your head with water and wash your feet up to the ankle it's compulsory that every Muslim should do ablution should do wudu before we offer our salah and a similar message is given in the holy bible in the book of exodus chapter number 40 verse number 31 and 32 that Moses 
and Aaron and the sons washed their hands and feet thereat. And they entered the temple of the congregation. And when they approached the altar, they washed as was commanded by the Lord to Moses. A similar message is given in Acts chapter number 21, verse number 26. And Paul took the men away. And the next day, along with them, he purified himself and entered the temple. We Muslims, we do ablution. We wash ourselves. We do the wudu. Before we offer the salah, to keep ourselves clean. We are hygienic people. And besides keeping ourselves clean, the wudu is also a sort of psychological preparation, a mental preparation that we do before we communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 56, hadith number 429, that the earth is made as a place for me and my followers to do sujood, as a masjid. Masjid means a place to do sujood. Our Prophet said that the whole world, the complete earth is a masjid for the believers. But natural, the place where you offer your salah, where you do sujood, it should be clean. It's also mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter 75, hadith number 692, and asked me Allah be pleased with him, he said, that the companion, when they stood for salah, his shoulder touched with the shoulder of his companion, and his foot touched with the foot of his companion. A similar message repeated in the book of Salah in Abu Dawood in chapter number 245, hadith number 666. The beloved Prophet, before starting the Salah, he said, Straighten your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder, close in the gaps, and do not leave any opening for the devil. The Prophet was not referring to the devil which you see in the Onida TV ad on the comic strip with two horns and a tail. The Prophet was referring to the devil of racism, of caste, of color, of wealth, irrespective whether you are black or white, whether rich or poor, whether king or pauper, to whichever family you may belong. When you stand for Salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. The basic method, the outline of offering Salah is given in a nutshell in the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 144, that turn your face to the sacred mosque, wherever you are, turn your face in that direction. It's compulsory that when we offer Salah, we should face the Qibla, that's towards the sacred mosque, towards Kaaba. And in India, we Muslims, we have to face towards the West. And when I travel in India, if I don't know the Qibla, the direction, and if I have to ask a non-Muslim, I do not ask him where is the West. What I do is I ask him where is the east and then I face in the opposite direction. Otherwise he may think that we are worshipping the western world. <laughs> the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 238, that when you stand for remembering Allah, stand in a devout frame of mind. The Holy Quran says, stand in a devout frame frame of mind when you offer Salah. And reciting Surah Fatiha is compulsory in the Salah. And it's also mentioned in Surah Al-Hijr, chapter 15, verse number 87, that we have sent to you 
the oft repeated seven verses and the grand quran the oft repeated seven verses refers to surah fatiha and it's also called as the minor quran and the other portion of the quran is called as the grand quran it's compulsory that we should recite surah fatiha in every salah the word ruku that is bowing is mentioned in the holy quran no less than 13 times and the word sujood which is the best part of the salah is mentioned in the holy quran no less than 92 times and it's mentioned in 32 different surah of the holy quran and there is a separate chapter chapter number 32 called as as sajda the prostration and the holy quran says in surah al imran chapter 3 verse number 43 ya maryam muqlati li rabbiki wasjudi warqai ma'ar raqi'in o mary worship thy lord devoutly prostrate thyself and bow down with those who bow down the holy quran says in surah hajj chapter 22 verse 77 ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu o you who believe prostrate and bow down and humble yourself and do good deeds that you may prosper every prophet of allah subhanahu wa taala when he offered his prayer to allah subhanahu wa taala he did sujood he did prostration all the prophets and a similar message is also given in the bible if you read in the old testament in the book of genesis chapter number 17 verse number 3 says abraham fell on his face book of numbers chapter number 20 verse number 6 moses and aaron fell on their face book of joshua chapter number 5 verse number 14 joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship it's mentioned in the holy bible in the gospel of matthew chapter number 26 verse number 39 that when jesus peace be upon him goes to the garden of gethsemane he takes a few steps forward falls on his face and does prayer all the prophets of almighty god did it the sujood for offering salah and even an acrobat cannot do better than what we muslims do when the bible says fall on your face and pray to god the way we muslims do the reason we do sujood is as i mentioned earlier the mind is not directly under our control the body is directly under our control and in order to humble the mind you also have to humble the body and there is no better way of humbling the body than to put the highest part of the body the forehead which also has the frontal lobe of the brain which is the most important organ to the lowest part on the ground and then say glory be to allah the most high glory be to allah the most high regarding the minute details of how to offer salah where to keep the hand how to stand how to sit etc how many rakats to offer the holy quran says atiullah wa atir rasul obey allah and obey the messenger you have to look at the prophet the quran says atiullah wa atir rasul in several places in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 32 in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 132 in surah nisa chapter 4 verse 59 In Surah Maida, chapter five, verse ninety-two. In Surah Anfal, chapter number eight, verse number one. In Surah Anfal, chapter number eight, verse number twenty. In Surah Anfal, chapter number eight, verse number forty-six. In Surah Nur, chapter number twenty-four, verse fifty-four. In Surah Nur, chapter twenty-four, verse fifty-six. In Surah Muhammad, chapter forty-seven, verse number thirty-three. In Surah Mujadila, chapter fifty-eight, verse number thirteen. In several places, in Surah Taqabun, chapter number sixty-four, verse number twelve, the Holy Quran says, "Atiullah wa Atiu Rasul." Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. For the minute details, look at the Prophet, and it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number eighteen, hadith number six hundred and four, as well as in Sahih Bukhari, volume number nine, hadith number three fifty two. The Prophet said, "Pray as you have seen me praying. Pray as you have seen me praying." So, minute details you have to refer to the authentic hadith. The salah is the most important pillar of Islam after iman after faith 
and the Holy Quran says in Surah Dhariyat, chapter 51, verse 56. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَى إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. And the Arabic word ibadah comes from the root word abd which means a slave, a servant. It's the duty of every servant to be obedient to his master. And every human being is a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. And it's the duty of every human being to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are doing ibadah, you are doing worship. If you abstain from the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited you from doing, you are doing ibadah. Many people have the misconception that salah is the only form of ibadah. In fact, salah is the most important form of ibadah, but it's not the only form of ibadah. Following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ibadah, and salah is the most important form of ibadah. Salah can also mean rendering obedience. You can only be obedient if you know what you are reciting in your salah. If you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you to do. Therefore it's compulsory that every Muslim should know what he is reciting in a salah. He should also read the Holy Quran. If he doesn't understand Arabic, he should also read its translation, its meaning so that he can implement on the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are various dangers if a person doesn't offer salah. There are chances your faith can become weak or it can even get lost. Because the human being thinks that the well-being and honor that he has is due to the worldly material things and he goes away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is lack of discipline when he goes away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to acquire the worldly desires, the material things. There are chances that he may do foul play and go away from the Sirat al-Mustaqeem, from the straight path. There is lack of inner peace. Irrespective of how much wealth a person has, the wealth cannot gain him peace. And the reason that the people don't offer salah is due to lack of knowledge. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 185, Kullu nafsin Every soul shall have a taste of death. And you shall have your total recompense on the day of judgment. And only he who is saved from the hellfire and is admitted to the gardens shall have achieved the objectives of the life. For verily, the life in this world is a mere deception of goods and chattels. There are various benefits of offering Salah. Salah is a way of life. It caters to the spiritual aspect of your soul and the physical needs of your body. The Salah, it increases your faith. It strengthens your faith. The Holy Quran says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 2, that the true believers are those who when Allah is mentioned, feel a tremor in the heart. And when His signs are rehearsed, it strengthens their faith and they put their complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Quran says in Surah Fatiha, chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, Iyya kana abdu wa iyya kana stain. Dear alone we worship, dear alone we ask for help. Ihdina surat al-mustaqeem. Surat al-lazina namta alayhim, ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim, walad ballin. Show us the straight path. The path of those who have earned high favor. And of those whose path is not wrought, nor who go astray. 
it increases the discipline of your life. A true Muslim, he starts his day by offering the Fajr Salah. And in the Fajr Salah, the Muazzin, in the Adhan, he also adds, As salatu khairu minan norm. That Salah is better than sleep. Offering prayer is better than sleeping. And a true Muslim, at intervals, he offers Salah. And he ends his day with the Isha Salah before he goes to sleep. The Salah, it also improves the social conditions. The congregational Salah, it increases the brotherhood, the fraternity, the unity and is an example of equality. The solidarity increases. When the people of the community, they meet each other and the love and affection between them increases. The Holy Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhan nasu, inna khalaqnaakum min zakru wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba ila li ta'arahu inna akramakum in the law hiyat kaakum inna allaha alimun khabir O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa who has righteousness and Allah is all knowing full of wisdom the criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not caste, it's not color, it's not creed, it's not wealth, it's not sex, but it is taqwa, it's righteousness, it's God consciousness, it's piety. The Holy Quran says in Surah Humza, chapter 104, verse number one, lumaza. Woe to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. The Salah prevents us from scandal monging and backbiting. The Holy Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 11 and 12. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanum. O you who believe, let not men amongst you laugh at others. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Let not women laugh at others. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Do not defame. Do not be sarcastic. Don't call each other with nicknames. Ya lazina amanu, O you believe, avoid suspicion. For suspicion in many cases is a sin. Do not spy on one another. Neither speak ill about people behind the back. That means don't backbite. Are you ready to eat the flesh of your dead brother? The Holy Quran says that if you backbite, it is as though you are eating the flesh of your dead brother. Because Eating the flesh of your dead brother is double crime. Eating flesh of a human being is a sin. Even the cannibals who eat human beings, they don't eat the meat of their own brother. So the Holy Quran says if you backbite, you are doing double sin. It is as though you are eating the flesh of your dead brother. Speaking ill about someone without proof is a sin. Speaking ill about someone behind the back is double sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and gives the answer, Nay, you will abhor it. The Salah, it increases truthfulness and honesty in the business and the daily dealings. As I said earlier, the Quran says in Surah An-Kabut, chapter 29, verse number 45, Utlu ma uhiya ilayka minal kitabi wa akim salata. Inna salata tanha anil fasha evil munkar. That recite of what we have revealed to thee of the inspiration of the book and establish regular prayers. For verily, prayers restrain you from shameful and unjust deed. The Holy Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 81 Wakul jal haq wa zakil batil. Inna la batil akana zahuka. Say, Truly, truth has arrived and falsehood perished. For verily, falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Salah teaches us that we should be truthful. A similar message is repeated in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, 
verse number 42 and 43. That cover not the truth with falsehood, nor conceal the truth when you know it. The Quran teaches us to be truthful, to always be truthful. The Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 188, that eat up not your wealth on vanity, so that you may use it as a bait for the judges to eat up little bit of somebody else's property, knowingly or unknowingly. The Holy Quran says that bribing is forbidden. You should not bribe. It gives us a way how to lead a truthful life. The Holy Quran, it brings a person inner peace. As it says in Surah Rod, Chapter 13, verse number 28. That verily, in the remembrance of Allah, hearts do find peace and tranquility. Means when you remember Allah, when you offer salah, you have a peaceful life. You acquire tranquility. It is the best way of communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 153. Ya ayyuha allazina amanu sta'inu bis sabri wa salah O you who believe seek Allah's help with patient perseverance and prayers Inna Allah ma sabreen for verily Allah is with those who patiently persevere Allah says Inna Allah ma sabreen for verily Allah is with those who patiently persevere Besides the social benefits, the spiritual benefits, and the other benefits, in Salah, we also acquire physical and medical benefits. In Salah, when we do Ruku, that is bow down, extra blood flows into the upper part of the body. The spine becomes supple. The spinal nerves are nourished. It relieves backache and pain. It's a good posture for flatulence. When we come back to the ar position, that is after Ruku, when we stand up, the blood which has entered in the upper part of the body comes back to normalcy and the body is relaxed. When we do sujood, we put our forehead on the ground. It's the best position of Salah. It is the most important part of Salah. Daily, the human beings are propounded by electrostatic charges from the atmosphere, which gets precipitated in the central nervous system, which gets supersaturated. These extra electrostatic charges have to be dissipated and discharged. Otherwise, you will have headache, neck ache, muscle spasms, etc. No wonder people regularly take tranquilizers and drugs to relieve the pain. These extra electrostatic charges have to be dissipated and discharged. For example, how do you have a heavy electric appliance? It normally has a three pin plug. The third pin and the third wire is for grounding, for earthing. Similarly, where we do sujood, we put the forehead on the ground. And the best part of the body, the brain, and the best part of the brain, the frontal lobe, is put on the ground, which causes grounding or discharging of these extra electrostatic charges. That does not mean that if you put your hand below the musalla, the prayer mat, you get a shock. But there is dominance of the frontal lobe. And the thinking capacity of the brain is not on the top of the brain, it is in the frontal lobe. Therefore, we do sujood in Salah. When we do sajda, there is extra blood supply going to the brain which is responsible for a healthy brain. 
Where do sujood extra blood flows into the skin of the face and the neck, which increases the blood circulation of the skin of the face, which is very healthy, especially in cold season. It prevents diseases such as fibrositis and chilblains. When you do sujood, there is drainage of the paranasal sinuses, and there is less chances you'll have sinusitis. That is inflammation of the sinuses. Normally, the human beings throughout the day they have an erect posture, and the maxillary sinus, the ostium, the opening is in the upper medial part, and the secretions because of the erect posture cannot be drained. Therefore, in sujood, it's like inverting a pot which is full. It causes drainage of the maxillary sinus. It also causes drainage of the secretion of the frontal sinus, the ethmoidal sinus, and the spinoidal sinus. And there's less chances a person will have sinusitis. Or if he's suffering from sinusitis, it's a natural treatment. Sujood is also a natural treatment for a person suffering from bronchiectasis, which causes drainage of the secretion of the bronchial tree. It prevents the accumulation of the secretion in the bronchial tree. It's also helpful in other pulmonary diseases in which secretions are accumulated. Besides secretions, other things like dust and bacteria can also accumulate. It's helpful in all these diseases. Normally, when you breathe, only two third of your lung capacity is utilized. The remaining one third of the lung, the air remains in. Only two third air comes in as fresh air. And goes out. The one third air is called as residual air. When you do sujood, the abdominal viscera they press against the diaphragm, and the diaphragm it presses against the lower lobes of the lung, which causes exhaling of even this residual air. So once the residual air goes out, more fresh air comes in, which is responsible for a healthy lung. When you do sujood. Due to decreased gravitational force, there is extra venous return from the abdominal organs. The venous return of the abdominal organ it increases. The sujood and ruku, it's a good posture against femoral and esophageal hernia. It's also a prophylaxis treatment in a person suffering from hemorrhoid, which in layman's terminology is called as piles. It's also helpful in the prolapse of the uterus. When you do sujood, your weight is concentrated on the knees when your legs are flexed, and the soleus and the gastrocnemius muscles, the muscles of the leg, are also called the peripheral heart because it has an extensive venous return, which is responsible for increasing the venous return of the lower half of the body. And it also causes relaxation of the lower half of the body. Where do sujood? Your knees are touching on the floor, including your hands and your forehead. This posture is helpful in disease of the cervical spine because it is helpful in the intervertebral joints. The posture of the sujood is also helpful in cardiac diseases. When a person Rises from sujood in the jalsa position, in the squatting position. The blood which has flowed in the upper part of the body comes back to normalcy, and his body is relaxed. There is extra blood flowing in the muscles and nerves of the thigh and the back. The back muscles are relaxed. It's useful and helpful in constipation and indigestion. It's helpful in a person suffering from peptic ulcer. And other stomach ailments. When a person gets up from the squatting position to the kiam position to the standing position, his weight is concentrated on the ball of the feet, which improves the strength of the back muscles, thigh muscle, knee muscle, and leg muscle. There are various benefits, physical and medical, when we offer salah. But we Muslims. 
we don't offer salah for these medical benefits. These are only side dishes. We offer salah to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to thank Him. We offer salah for guidance, to be programmed towards righteousness. These side dishes, the medical benefits, may attract a person who has less faith or may attract a non-believer. But we Muslims, our main course is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's a commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our biryani. There are some people who may ask that we see a few Muslims who offer salah five times a day but yet they cheat, they are not honest, they are unrighteous people. So how come when you say salah is a programming towards righteousness, few Muslims we know who offer five times salah, very regular, but yet they are not righteous. The answer to this question was given by the Qari in the beginning of a talk and he recited verses from Surah al muminun chapter 23, verse number 1 and 2 which says, Qad aflah al muminun Allazinahum fi salatihim khashi'oon Indeed successful are the believers Those who pray with humility and attentiveness Arabic word khashi'oon is derived from khushu which means humility and attentiveness So Allah says all those who offer salah with attentiveness and humility they will indeed be successful they will derive the benefits. But all those who only pray outwardly without humility and attentiveness, they will not derive the benefits of Salah. So these few Muslims who offer Salah and do not derive the benefits and are not righteous, it is because they only offer the Salah outwardly without humility and attentiveness. And for a person to be attentive, but natural, he should know the meaning of what is offering the Salah and he should follow the commandments what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. For example, in the Salah, if the Imam after Surah Fatiha recites Surah Ikhlas and says, Qul huallahu ahad, say he is Allah one and only. All the Muslims who come to the mosque to offer Salah, they agree that Allah is one and only. No one says there is more than one Allah. Who is the Imam giving guidance to? What the Imam is doing, he is conveying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Muslims and saying, Qul huallahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Go and tell to those people who do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who do not believe Allah is one, go and tell them that say there is Allah one and only. So the Imam is telling the Muslims, Go out and tell to the other people who do not believe Allah is one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and only and describe to them the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many Muslims offer salah but when they immediately finish their salah the message what they received in the salah has no impact on the life at all and the main reason is because they have not understood the message. So if you don't understand the message, how will you implement it? You have to follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to derive the benefits of the salah. For example, if you have a servant who is very punctual, who is very regular in coming to work and he comes to the office and he praises you. But when you give him any work or ask him to even get a glass of water, he continues praising you but does not get the glass of water. You ring the bell and your servant comes running to you. Yes, master. When you tell him that this is an important, urgent letter, please deliver it to my client. It's very urgent. Your servant stays in the office and continues saying, I am obedient to my master. My master is great. What will you do? Will you give him a promotion? Will you give him a bonus? Will you kick him out of the job? 
So similarly, it is a duty that the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the human beings, we should follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only by offering praises, it's not sufficient. For example, a sick man, he goes to a doctor and the doctor gives him a prescription and he writes in it that you have to take the following tablets thrice a day. The patient takes the prescription and religiously, very dedicatedly, he reads the prescription thrice a day but does not implement on the message of the prescription. He does not take the tablets. Do you think he'll be cured of his sickness? So in order to derive the benefit of the Salah, you should even follow the commandments which we get in the Salah. That's the reason there are few people who offer Salah but do not get the benefit of the Salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a few of these people in Surah Ma'un, chapter number 107, verse number 4 to 7 which says, that woe to the worshippers, those who are neglectful of the prayers, who only pray to be seen of men, but do not even provide neighborly needs. With such people, the Holy Quran says, only pray to be seen of men. Woe to them, curse them. The Holy Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 142, that the hypocrites, when they stand in prayers, they do not stand with earnestness. They only pray to be seen of men. And little do they have Allah in remembrance. Allah says, there are people who are hypocrites, who only pray to be seen of men, but do not pray with earnestness. Neither remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their salah. Every Muslim, it is compulsory that he should offer salah five times a day. There is no option. Even when he's traveling, he should offer salah. But there are certain concessions given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 101, that when you travel in the earth, there is no blame on you if you shorten your salah. When you're traveling, you can shorten the four rakats of Zohar, Asar, and, and the last Isha salah to two rakats. You can even combine the Zohar and the Asar Salah as well as combine the Maghrib and the Isha Salah. It's a confession given to you. There's no excuse for you not to pray. Even in the battlefield, you have to offer Salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the guidance how Salah should be offered in the battlefield. The Holy Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 102 that, O oh Prophet, when thou standest for Salah in the battlefield, take one party of the men to stand with you for Salah along with the arms. And when they finish the Salah, let them go behind and ask the other party to offer Salah. But you can have the arms in your hand when you're offering Salah. The Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 239, that if you fear any danger or any enemy, you can even pray on the foot or while riding. But when you are in security, celebrate the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He has taught you. The Holy Quran says that offering salah is compulsory, irrespective you are at war, in danger, and the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 103, that offer the salah standing or sitting or lying. But when you're free from danger, offer it in the regular manner. In the battlefield, if you fear there's danger or any other danger, you can offer salah even while standing or sitting or lying on your sides. Even if you're sick, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse number 191 that the believers offer the salah standing, sitting or lying on their sides. And it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. And the translation of Sahih Bukhari has got nine volumes. This is the first volume. And it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Volume number two. In the book of Taqseer. Chapter number 19. Hadith number 218. That a person approached the Prophet and said he was suffering from hemorrhoids, piles. How should he perform the Salah? 
the prophet said pray while standing if you can't do it pray while sitting if you can't do it pray while lying on your sides even if you are sick you have no excuse for missing your salah if you can't stand pray while sitting if you can't sit pray while lying on your sides you can even pray with ishara with just indication but offering salah is compulsory there is no excuse for you to miss your salah the holy quran says in surah maida chapter 5 verse number 55 that your true friends are no less than allah his messenger and the believers who offer their salah who practice regular charity and who humble themselves it's mentioned abu daud this is abu daud abu daud has got three volumes it's mentioned abu daud volume number 1 in the book of salah chapter number 300 hadith number 863 and the prophet said that the first thing a person will be asked to account amongst all his actions on the day of judgment is salah means the first thing allah subhanahu wa taala will inquire you is regarding salah and the holy prophet said it's mentioned sai muslim this is sai muslim few people may have the translation it's available in arabic this is sai muslim it's mentioned in sai muslim volume number 1 sai muslim consists of four volumes this is all the first volume mention volume number 1 in the book of faith chapter number 36 hadith number 146 that the difference between a man and the difference between a mushrik a polytheist and kafir an unbeliever is the negligence of salah it's mentioned abu daud volume number 3 in the kitab musanna chapter number 1691 hadith number 4661 it says that the difference between a servant and a kafir an unbeliever is the abandonment of prayer means anyone who is negligent of his salah or abandon salah according to this hadith he is equivalent to a kafir the holy quran says in surah mudassir chapter 74 verse number 41 to 43 ask the sinners that what led them into the hell fire and they will say we were not of those who offered salah we were not of those who prayed there is a beautiful dua given in the holy quran in surah ibrahim chapter 14 verse number 40 which says that oh my lord make me one who establishes regular prayers and raise such people amongst my offspring oh my lord grant me this favor the dua given in the holy quran in surah al baqarah chapter 2 verse number 201 which is a very famous dua is rabbana atina fid dunya hasnatan wa fil akhirati hasnatan wa qina azab an-nar that oh my lord give me the good in this world and in the hereafter and save me from the torment of hellfire i would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the holy quran in surah al anam chapter 6 verse 162 and 163 which says kul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alamin لا شريك له وبذلك امرت وانا اول المسلمين that say truly my prayers my service of sacrifice my life and death is all for allah subhanahu wa taala the cherisher of this world he has no partner this i have been commanded and i am of the first to bow to his will wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Allahu 
Now we would have the question and answer session. To derive more benefit for all present here today in the limited time available, we would like the following rules to be observed during the question and answer session. Questions asked should be on the topic Salah, the programming towards righteousness only. Questions not relevant to the topic would not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you would have to line up at the back of the row again and await your second chance for asking a question. Three mics have been provided in the auditorium for the audience. Two for the gents on my right and left and one for the ladies at the back in the center aisle. Please stand in a queue at one of the mics if you wish to put forward a question and speak into the mic only when the mic is handed to you by the mic handling assistants. Written questions on slip papers would be given secondary preference. These slips are available from our volunteers on the sides. Kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question. We will allow one question only on each of the mics in clockwise rotation. May we have the first questions from the sisters at the back. I'm Wahida Khan. I'm doing my uh, B.Ed. and I've done my M.A. My question is, why do the Muslims offer Salah in Arabic when they do not understand it? Will it not be preferable to offer Salah in a local or a regional language? The sister has posed the question that when most of the Muslims don't understand Arabic, won't it be preferable to offer Salah in the local or regional languages? Won't that be better? Sister, if for the sake of argument, if I agree with you, that let's offer Salah in the local language. So in Bombay, there will be few people who will say, let's offer in English. Few may say Urdu, few may say Hindi, some may say Gujarati. There will be an infighting. Even if we come to a common opinion and agree, that let's say in Masjid number one, Mosque one, we offer Salah in English. Mosque two in Urdu. Mosque three in Hindi. Mosque four in Gujarati and so on and so forth. Again, there will be confusion and fighting. Some may say that in Masjid number one, where you're offering Salah in English, we will follow the translation of Allama Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Some may say we will follow translation of Pikthal. Some may say Maulana Abdul Majid Daryabadi, others may say Mohsin Khan. Again, they'll be fighting. Even if we agree that, okay, let's follow one particular translation. Yet, the translation sister is a human handiwork. It cannot substitute the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the word of the Prophet. And in translation, there can be mistakes. And if there are mistakes, this mistake will be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, if you are offering Salah in Majid number 2, where they are offering in Urdu. And suppose the Imam recites Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse 34. And if you read the translation, most of the Urdu translations, they translate this verse of the Holy Quran as, no one besides Allah has the knowledge of the sex of the child in the mother's womb. If you check the Arabic text, the Arabic word sex is not there in the Quran. It's the own interpretation of most of the Urdu translators. And if a doctor is offering Salah, he will start thinking that what kind of a prayer is this that no one besides Allah knows the sex of the child in the mother's womb. Today we know by ultrasonography, we can very well identify sex of the child. He will start doubting. So therefore, you cannot read the translation. Because if you read the translation and if you commit any mistake, the mistake will be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if it's the verse of the Holy Quran or to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if it's a hadith. And the translation cannot complete 
the full meaning. It can help you in somewhat knowing the meaning to help you to concentrate. For example, since I'm a person who keep on traveling, if I go to France, according to our logic, the Salah has to be offered in French. If the Salah has to be offered in French, but naturally even the Adhan should be in French. So if I go to France and the Muazzin gives the Adhan in French, I'll be wondering who is he cursing. And if I go to the mosque and attend the Salah, it will be in French. I will wonder whether the Imam is praising Allah or telling a story in French. So if the Salah is in Arabic, irrespective whether I, as an Indian, who don't know French or German, if I go to Germany or France or Spain or any part of the world, if I offer Salah, I will at least know what I'm offering and I will know its meaning. And the Arabic Adhan is the international anthem of the Muslims throughout the world. International anthem of the Muslims throughout the world. He may belong to any part. He may belong to any part of the world. He will surely understand the meaning of that Adhan. It's an international anthem. Therefore, sister, the best advice is that we Muslims should learn the language of the Holy Quran. If we don't know Quranic Arabic, then we should at least know the meaning, the translation, in the language you understand the best of those verses you read in the Holy Quran, so that you will be able to derive the benefits of the Salah. Hope that answers the question. Next question from the brother on the right. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Rafiq Vatgaonkar, business. Many non-Muslims allege that when Islam is against idol worship, why do the Muslims worship and bow down to the Kaaba in their prayers? The brother posed the question that many non-Muslims allege that when Islam is against idol worship, why do we bow down to the Kaaba and why do we worship the Kaaba? Indicating that we are the biggest idol worshippers. We Muslims, we bow down towards the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla. It's a direction. We don't worship the Kaaba. We bow towards the Kaaba. In a Salah, we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. We in Islam, we believe in unity. Suppose the Muslims want to offer Salah here. Some may say, let's face north. Some may say, let's face south. Some may say east. Some may say west. Which direction do you face? So for unity, all the people in the world, all the Muslims in the world, they have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to face towards the Kaaba. If you are in the west, you face towards the east. If you are in the east, you face towards the west. If you are in the north, towards the south. If you are in the south, towards the north. All Muslims face in one direction for unity. And the Muslims were the first people who drew the world map. And when they drew it, they had the South Pole on top and North Pole down. And Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba, the city of Mecca was in the center. The Westerners came and they turned the map upside down. And today, we have the North Pole on top and South Pole down. But yet, Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba is yet in the center. <laughs> when we Muslims go for Hajj and men do the Tawaf, we circumambulate around the Kaaba. We circumambulate to indicate that every circle, all the circles have only one center to indicate that we worship only one true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. And the best answer was given by Hadrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, who was the second Khalifa of Islam. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, in volume number 2, chapter number 56, hadith number 675, in the book of Hajj. Hadrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said to the black stone of Kaaba, Sangyaswad, he said that you are only a stone. You cannot harm me nor benefit me. Had it not been that I had seen the Prophet kissing and touching you, I would not have kissed or touched you. This hadith is sufficient to prove that we Muslims, we don't worship the Kaaba. And the best answer you can give is that at the time of the Prophet, there were people who even stood on the Kaaba and gave the Adhan. 
I want to ask the question, which idol worshipper will stand on the idol he worships? I am Irshad from my final year computer engineering. Uh, how will you reply to a non-Muslim who says that Salah is nothing but uh, another form of gymnastics? So that was the question that how will you reply to a non-Muslim who says that Salah is nothing but another form of gymnastics? Like what benefits you get there, you get there also. It's just a gymnastics, you know, standing up, bowing down, going down, etc. Brother, there is a world of a difference between Salah and gymnastics. In Salah, there is development of the body as well as of the soul. In gymnastics, you may develop the body, but there is no development of the soul. In Salah, you get mental peace and tranquility. You don't get tranquility and mental peace in gymnastics. In the Salah, the movements are smooth, without jerk. In gymnastics, the movements are with jerks. After Salah, it removes your laziness. After gymnastics, you get fatigued. After Salah, you feel like working. After gymnastics, you get tired, don't feel like working. Salah can be offered by people of all the ages. Gymnastics cannot be offered by people of all the ages. <laughs> Salah is absolutely free. In gymnastics, if you go to a good gymnasium, you have to pay through your noses. In Salah, you don't require any equipment. In gymnastics, you require, you know, the parallel bars and rings, etc. In the Salah, in the Salah, the social conditions improve. The improvement of brotherhood, of unity, of solidarity. In gymnastics, there is no improvement of social condition. In the Salah, it guides you towards righteousness. It makes you a better human being. In gymnastics, it doesn't make you a better human being or it does not improve your righteousness. But the main reason we offer Salah is to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our niya should be there. Even if someone has a gymnastic, exactly same posture as the Salah, it will not be equivalent because in Salah we have the niya, the intention to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek His pleasure which you can never acquire in gymnastics. Assalamu alaikum brother. My name is Tabassum. Why does Allah require us to praise Him? What benefit does He get? The sister asked the question that why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala require us to praise Him and in what way does He benefit? Sister, when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or suppose someone says Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. It doesn't make Allah more greater. Allah is already the greatest. Whether you say Allah Akbar a million times or whether you don't say, Allah will yet remain the greatest. He is the greatest and will remain the greatest. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not for His benefit. And the answer is given in the Holy Quran in Surah Fatih, chapter 35, verse number 15, that, O ye men, it is you who require Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is you who want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free of all wants, worthy of all praises. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require us to praise Him for His benefit. He requires us to praise Him for our benefit. Because, but natural, we will follow the advice of a person who is famous, intelligent, popular and wise. You will not follow the advice of a person who is a stranger, unknown, who is not intelligent, who is not wise. Therefore, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to satisfy ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most intelligent, the most wise, the most greatest, the supreme. So that indicating that we should follow His commandments. That's the reason that in Surah Fatiha, the opening chapter which is always recited in the Salah, the first four or five verses are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Most gracious, most merciful. 
iyak na abdu iyak na stain they alone we worship they alone we ask for help we are praising allah subhanahu wa taala to convince us that he is the greatest he is the only person who you can go for ultimate help and after this then we recite the last few verses of surah fatiha ihdina sirat al mustaqim sirat al ladina anamta alaihim ghair al maghdubi alaihim wal dallin show us the straight path the path of those who have earned thy favor and not of those who go astray and not the path of those which is wrath therefore we pray to allah subhanahu wa taala to satisfy self that he is worth asking for he is worth taking the advice of and then we ask for help and advice for example if a person has certain heart problem he is sick if a person who is unknown who is a stranger who you don't even know he comes and gives you advice will you take his advice or will you take the advice of a person who you know is a very famous heart specialist who the advice will you take but naturally you will take the advice of a person who is a heart specialist who is a doctor so therefore we pray to allah subhanahu wa taala to satisfy ourselves for our own benefit but irrespective how much you pray to allah subhanahu wa taala it's not sufficient because the holy quran says in surah kahf chapter 18 verse number 109 that if the ocean was made into ink to write the words of allah subhanahu wa taala the words of allah subhanahu wa taala will not exhaust even if you put to its aid another ocean a similar message repeated in surah luqman chapter 31 verse 27 that if you convert all the trees on the earth into pen and the ocean backed with seven ocean for its supply into ink to write the words of allah subhanahu wa taala yet the words of allah subhanahu wa taala will not exhaust how much you pray it is insufficient but yet we pray allah subhanahu wa taala and allah requires us to praise him not for his benefit but he requires us to praise him for our benefit so that we agree he is supreme he is great he is intelligent he is most wise so that we can follow his commandments and stay on the sirat al mustaqim the true path assalam alaikum zakir sahab uh, my name is jahangir i am a revert my question is uh, what should i do if my office timings do not permit me to pray on time the brother has a question that what should he do if his office timings do not permit him to pray on time if you analyze the five daily salah which is the fard as far as the fajr salah that the morning salah the isha salah night salah these don't clash normally with the office timings even the maghrib salah doesn't clash when it comes to zuhar salah the afternoon salah it can be prayed during the lunch time most often the lunch timings of the office match with the zuhar salah the problem that arises mainly is in the asar salah or you may have difficulties in other salahs if you are doing night shift etc but if you have problems if your office timings are clashing with the timings of the salah what you should do is that you should request your employer to give you a break of 10 minutes to offer your salah but most of the muslims we are afraid to ask our employer for time off for offering salah for other things we ask for going for picnic and going for weddings and birthday parties you ask but for offering salah we feel shy most of the muslims we are apologetic we have an inferiority complex and your employer even if he is a non muslim my experience tells me that 99% time he will give you time off for your salah but you should request him nicely humbly but when he gives you time off there are some muslims who take a break for more than an hour for salah and they say we have gone to a far off mosque the employer will start thinking that have you gone for salah or have you gone for a stroll i have got no objection a person goes to pray in the masjid the mosque if it's close by if it's not close by or it will take a lot of time you can very well even pray in the office 
you can have a compact prayer mat, a musalla, and keep in a locker. As I mentioned in my talk, our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 56, hadith number 429, that the earth has been made for me and my followers as a masjid, as a place for doing sujood. Therefore, when the time for prayer is up, you can pray. You can even offer in your office, see to it that you find a very clean place, and you can offer salah. Don't pray extra nawafil, etc. Pray your for a salah, as well as sunnah al That is sufficient. But there are some people who, when they go to offer salah, and if they find that picture is obstructing them for salah, they take out the picture. Or they cover the picture with the cloth. If the picture is obstructing your salah, pray in another room. Why you have to pray in the room which has the picture? Go in another room. Then there are some people who in a non-Muslim office, they want to make a jamaat. I've got no objection if you make a jamaat. But see to it that all the Muslim employees in that office don't leave the work simultaneously so that the office work comes to a standstill. You can very well pray in several jamaat. As if you see, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in hadith number six to seven, in the book of Adan, chapter number 35. It says that even a jamaat can be made by two people. Even two people are sufficient for jamaat. So if you work in non-Muslim atmosphere, don't put the office work at standstill. Offer in various jamaats. And if a person, if a Muslim, works dedicatedly, honestly, no employer, even if he's a non-Muslim, will prevent you from a break for offering salah. If your employer is uncompromising, you can very well bargain with him and tell him that, okay, I will not take my tea break. Please give me break for my asar salah. Or you can say that if I take a 10 minutes break, after office hours, I will work double. I will work triple. I will work for half an hour free of charge. Don't give me overtime. Any businessman will agree with the person who is taking 10 minutes off and is working half an hour extra after office hours. Normally you have to pay double or one and a half times. So you tell him, I will work thrice the time of the break and don't give me a single pie. He will surely agree. But in extreme cases, if your employer is amongst the one person or uncompromising at all, the best option for you is remaining is that you change the job. Offering salah is fard. If the employer is among the one person who doesn't give you a salah, change the job. You may never know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a job in which you may earn more. But irrespective whether you earn more or less in the new job, offering salah will gain you more benefit in the year after than not offering and getting a few hundred rupees more. Unfortunately, even in some of the Muslim offices which have most of the employees in it, Muslims, they don't offer salah. Neither alone, neither in Jamaat. I would like to request all the Muslim brothers that in the office, they should see to it that they themselves, along with their employees who are Muslims, they should offer salah. And there are always ways in which you cannot disturb your office work and yet offer salah. In fact, in the long run, if you offer salah along with the employees, it will help you in your business and you will make more profit. Hope that answers the question. Assalamualaikum, brother. Are women allowed to pray in the mosque? The sister has a question that are women allowed to pray in a mosque? There is no verse in the Holy Quran which prohibits a woman from praying in the mosque. Neither is there any authentic hadith which says that a woman cannot pray in a mosque or go to a mosque. In fact, there are several hadith which speak the opposite. If you read Sahih Bukhari volume number one. The last hadith, hadith number 832 of the book of characteristics of Salah, which is chapter number 84, it says that when your wives ask to go to the mosque, do not forbid them. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Characteristics of Salah, chapter number 80, Hadith 824. It says that when the woman 
ask you to go to the mosque at night, allow them. Even at night, when they ask you to go to the mosque, the Sahih Bukhari, volume 1, hadith number 824 says that you should allow them to go to the mosque. This is also mentioned Sahih Muslim. With Sahih Muslim, point number 1, in the book of Salah, chapter number 175, hadith number 881, it says, that Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the best row for the men are the first row and the worst are the last rows. The best rows for the women are the last rows and the worst are the first rows. Indicating that men and women pray together in the mosque and when they pray together, the best row for the men is the first row and the best for the women is the last row. The worst for the men is the last row and worst for the women is the first row. There are several hadith. If you say Muslim, Poem number one in the book of Salah, chapter 177, hadith number 884, it says that do not prevent the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to the mosque. Say Muslim, volume one, book of Salah, chapter number 177, hadith number 891, it says that do not take away the share of the mosque of the woman. That means, during the time of the Prophet, the women did go to the mosque and Prophet never prevented them from entering the mosque. But, whenever women enter the mosque, there should be equal and separate facility in the mosque. There should be no intermingling of the sexes, like how you have in the other place of worship. Otherwise, people will go more for ease teasing than to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Separate entrance, separate wudu facility, separate place for prayer. And but natural, a woman cannot stand in front of the men. Otherwise the men will concentrate more on the woman than on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Equal but separate facilities. If it's side, then preferably a partition. Or they should pray behind. Equal but separate facilities. If you analyze, if you go to Saudi Arabia, the women are allowed in the mosque. Even the Harmain, Harmain Sharif, the Masjid Haram in Mecca, and Masjid Nabi in Medina, the women are allowed in the mosque. You go to America, women are allowed in the mosque. You go to UK, women are allowed in the mosque. You go to South Africa, women are allowed in the mosque. Women are allowed in the mosque in almost all parts of the world. It's only in India that most of the mosques do not give permission for the women to enter. But Alhamdulillah, there are few mosques in Bombay which I know of which do allow women to enter. And when I'd been to Kerala last year, they told me that there were no less than 500 mosques in Kerala alone which had separate facilities for the women to pray. So inshallah I believe that all those who are trustees of the mosque, even they refer to the Sahih Hadith and they do not prevent the female servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from entering the mosque even in Bombay. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Sheikh Ahmad, working profession. And my question to Brother Zakir is, what is the significance of raising our hands while saying uh, takbir during Salah? The brother asked the question that what is the significance of raising the hands when we say takbir in salah. Hands are a symbol of power and force. When we Muslims raise the hand in salah, it mainly signifies three things. First, we are submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By raising our hands, we are signifying so as to say that, Oh Allah, I submit to you. Like, how when we want a person to surrender, we say, hands up! You know, police says, hands up to the, to the robber. Indirectly telling him that you surrender. So when we do hands up, we are surrendering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And simultaneously, when we raise a hand, it also signifies the glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By action, as well as by words, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. And besides that, when we raise a hand and fold it over the chest, we are giving a signal that I am facing my back toward the worldly affairs and giving up everything to concentrate on the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Yusuf Desai. I am retired government official. My question is, at what time in the life of Holy Prophet 
Salah was ordained by Almighty. And what are the achievements of Shabbi Miraj? These two questions I think are related. Therefore I put the questions. So there was a question that at what time, exact date, he wants, was a beloved prophet ordained to offer Salah? And what is the significance of Mehraj in connection with Salah? Brother, exact date, day, like how we know when he died, when he was born, we don't know. But it was towards the early part of his prophethood. Because there are hadiths telling us that how did Archangel Gabriel show him to offer Salah? What he did? He put his foot in the ground and then water gushed forth from the ground. And Archangel Gabriel, he showed to the prophet how to do wudu. And he showed him how to do Salah. Same thing, the Prophet came home and repeated in front of his wife, Bibi Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her. So it was ordained in the early part of his prophethood. Regarding how many Salah exact to offer, and regarding the second part of the question, that's Sabi Mehraj, which is indication is given in the Holy Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 1, which says that the Prophet was transported from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa. And then it talks about the Mehraj and the description given to Sahih Bukhari and the Sahih Hadith that how he meant and he met the other prophets, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Moses peace be upon him, Jesus peace be upon him, Abraham peace be upon him. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained the prophet that the Muslims should offer 50 times salah. When he came down Musa alayhi salam according to Sahih Hadith, Sahih Bukhari, it says that 50 will be too difficult for the Muslims. Go and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, request him to make it less. He goes. When the Salah is made less, again he comes back, again the Prophet goes to make it less, and finally, in the ending, the Salah is made to five times. The Salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala agrees and says to the Prophet that offer five times Salah. And then he says that this five times will be equivalent to fifty times of Salah. Hope that answers the question. Salaam alaikum, brother. I'd like to ask you, why aren't all our prayers or supplications answered or fulfilled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The sister has posed a question that why are all our prayers not answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Sister, the answer to this question is given in the Holy Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 216, which says, but it is possible that you may dislike a thing which is good for you and you may love a thing which is bad for you for Allah knoweth everything and you know not Allah says in the Holy Quran it's possible that you may dislike a thing which is good for you and you may love a thing which is bad for you for example if a very religious pious person he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that please give me a motorcycle so it will help me in traveling and his prayer is not answered you people say, what a pious person, religious person, why is his prayer not being answered? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that if he acquires a motorcycle, he may have an accident and he may get crippled. As the Holy Quran says, that you may love a thing which is bad for you. Allah knows, you know not. Once, there was a very rich businessman who was going to catch a flight to London to click a deal which would fetch him a profit of more than a billion rupees. When he's traveling towards the airport, unfortunately, there is an unusual traffic jam on the road and he's unable to reach the airport on time. By the time he reaches the airport, the flight has already taken off. He misses the flight. He says in a very sorrowful tone, this is the worst thing that has happened to me in my life. While going back home, on the radio in the car, he hears the latest news. That the flight which you are supposed to catch, which was going to London, it crashed. And all the passengers in that flight, they died. So the businessman says, this is the best thing that happened to me in my life. <laughs> A few moments ago, he was cursing the traffic jam. Because of the traffic jam, he lost billions of rupees. A few moments later on, he thanks the traffic jam because it saved his life. As the Quran says, you may dislike a thing which is good for you. Allah knows, you know not. 
Allah knows that the life of the businessman was much more precious than the billions of rupees he was about to earn. Therefore, if you analyze that whatever you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many a times he does not fulfill your prayers he does not answer your prayers and it's mentioned in the holy quran in surah shura chapter 42 verse number 27 that if Allah were to increase if Allah were to increase the provisions of his servants they would surely transgress all bonds on the earth for Allah gives it to them in due measures and he knows what he gives the Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 186 that when they ask thee concerning me tell them I am close to them I am very close to them and I listen to every supplicant of my servant the message repeated in Surah Ghafir, chapter 40, verse number 60, that the Lord says, Ask me and I will answer your prayer. The Holy Quran says, that Allah says, Ask me and I will answer your prayer. People may think that this verse isn't fulfilled if your prayers aren't answered. Actually, if you analyze, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is answering your prayer by not answering it. Because He knows what is good and bad for you. There are some people who may say that we see many unbelievers, many unpious people who pray to false God and they lead a very luxurious life. These unbelievers, they pray to false God for money and they get wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if these unpious unbelievers, they pray to false God, He fulfills their material desires because He knows that what they are asking for is actually going to cause them more loss in the long run in the year after is going to cause nothing but loss the true believers are those irrespective whether they are rich or poor whether they are in good times or bad times they yet believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Holy Quran says in Surah Nur chapter 24 verse 37 that by the believers who neither traffic or merchandise can divert from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from establishing prayers from giving regular charity from humbling themselves for these people only fear that day on which heart and eyes will be transformed they only fear the akhirah the day of judgment which is the final day of accounting a true believer always says alhamdulillah irrespective of whatever happens alhamdulillah means praise be to Allah even if he goes in loss he says alhamdulillah because he has faith in Allah that if Allah allowed this loss to be incurred it has to be beneficent for him in the long run in short a true believer believes in Allah that whatever happens happens for good hope that answers the question Assalamu alaikum my name is Nayar Azam and I'm an engineer by profession my question is very close to the question those by from sister side in the beginning that the Juma Khutbah which is not a part of the Salah so is it compulsory to deliver in the Arabic language? The brother posed the question that is it compulsory to deliver the Jumma Khutbah in Arabic? There are differences of opinion among the scholars but with the exception of Imam Malik may Allah be pleased with him all the other scholars including Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal and all the other scholars, most of them may Allah be pleased with them all they agree that if the audience, if the congregation cannot understand Arabic the Jumma Khutbah can be given in any other language but the minimum requirement of Jumma Khutbah that is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending the blessing on the Prophet and the Arabic verses to be recited in the Jumma Khutbah, they should at least be in Arabic. The remaining part can be in any language. There is not a single authentic hadith in which the Prophet said that the Jumma Khutbah cannot be given in any other language. But I do know that the Prophet always gave the Khutbah in Arabic. And the reason was because the people of Arabia at that time, they only understood Arabic. 
So because then it's Arabic, the Prophet always gave the khutbah in Arabic. But no hadith says that he prevented people from giving the khutbah in any other language or he told other people not to give the khutbah in any other language. The reason the Jummah khutbah is there is because to guide the congregation towards the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet as well as to give them some guidance about the latest happenings in the community. In short, it is to guide and give advice to the Muslim Ummah. It will be illogical to say that I will give guidance to a person in a language he doesn't understand. So, but naturally when you give guidance, you should give in the language he understands. If you go to America, in America, they have the Juma Qutbah in English, many mosques. Many mosques throughout the world, they have Qutbah in the local language. In America, in Canada, in UK, in South Africa, many mosques have the Qutbah in English. If you go to Arabia, to the Arab countries, since the people understand Arabic, the Qutbah there is in Arabic. But last month when I had been to Kuwait, though the majority people of Kuwait understand Arabic, yet a few mosques, had the Qutbah in English, a few mosques had the Qutbah in Urdu, a few mosques even had Malayalam and other languages. This the government has given special permission so that the expatriates, those people who are not the residents of Kuwait, those who come from outside Kuwait for employment in Kuwait, they will receive guidance in the local language. So Qutbah can be given any language but the condition is that praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be in Arabic. The blessing invoking on Prophet should be in Arabic. And the dua that you have should be in Arabic. Which can consist even of few verses, few lines, which you can also translate in a khutbah. So there is no harm at all. In fact, people should be encouraged so that they get guidance. It should be given in the local language, except the few parts I mentioned. It should be in Arabic, which can also be translated. It's in India most parts of India and those mosques controlled by the Indian immigrants abroad where the Qutbah is only in Arabic. A few mosques have a pre kudba a new thing, pre kudba which is in the local language. A few mosques have translation of the Qutbah after the Jumma Salah. Therefore I request and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He also give Hidayah to the people in India that even in India we have the Qutba in the local language so that we get guidance every week during Jummah. Brother Zakir, Assalamu Alaikum. My name is Abdul Qadar. I am a businessman come social worker. As you said, we Muslims pray five times on Allah Ta'ala. And then you also explain in Mirage events how five times prayer was fixed. But we see some of brothers, they do three times a day. Is there, is there any justification in doing so? The brother asked that, as I mentioned, that how five times is compulsory, and they will mention the Quran. Some people offer three times Salah. Is it justified? According to the Quran, you should pray five times Salah every day. But there are certain concessions given to you. The verses I recited, in which five times is compulsory, is Surah Hud, chapter 11, verse 114. Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 78. Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 130. And Surah Rum, chapter 30, verse 17 and 18. If you read these verses, these verses clearly say you should pray five times. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you concessions certain times. As it's mentioned for Nisa chapter 4, verse number 101, that when you travel, you can shorten your salah. As I mentioned, four rakats of Zohar, Asar, and Isha can be shortened to rakats. And when you're traveling, since it will be inconvenient, you can join the Zohar and the Asar salah. And if you want, you can join the Maghrib and the Isha salah. So when people join, it becomes thrice. So when you're traveling, anyone does, I've got no objection. There have been hadith showing that in times of difficulty, there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari which says that it was raining very heavily and people could not 
after Maghrib Salah, come again for the Isha Salah, so the Prophet joined. So during any calamity and any difficulty, the Prophet has given permission that you can join. But I do know there are some people who say, oh, I have to go to office. Therefore, I will join my Asar and Zohar together. Just for small petty things, you want to go shopping. You want to go shopping and then I'll take five hours for shopping. So I miss my Asar Salah. So I joined my Zohar and Asar. This is not allowed. While traveling and in times of actual difficulties, the Prophet has given you permission. Otherwise, under normal circumstances, you should pray five times Salah every day. Hope that answers the question. Salam Zakir Naik. Adan ki pahli shuruat. Pahli shuruat kisne ki aur kabhi hui aur kaha se huwa hai? Wa koon sa desh mein hui? This is the question that the Adan, how did it originate? In which land and how did it take place? Sister, it took place in the land of Arabia, the city of Medina, and given in the hadith that we have, that when the mosque was constructed, the Prophet and the Sahaba they were discussing how to call the people. Some people suggested the drum beat, some people suggested the conch, and various suggestions were given. And the hadith says that a person, he, in his vision, he heard the words of the Adan, which I recited in my talk, by human voice, which came to the knowledge of the Prophet. And the Prophet agreed that whatever he heard, the words are very good. And there is no better way of calling the people to Salah this way and using the human voice. That's when the Prophet commanded that when you call people for Salah, use your human voice instead of the other things which people use like drum, trumpet, etc. And it was in Medina. Hope that answers the question. We would now be starting the questions on the slips too. The procedure would be such. One question I would put now on the slip, then on the mic, on my right hand side, again on the slip, then on the mic, on the left hand side, again on the slip, then on the sister, and such manner in a clockwise rotation. The question is from Brother Abdullah. He asks, there are several methods of performing Salah. Are all of them acceptable? Or is there only one common method of offering Salah? The brother asked the question that there are several ways of offering Salah and I do know of that. Are all of them acceptable? Are all of them correct? Or there is only one common method? If you go to the market, you will find hundreds of books on describing the method of how to perform Salah. Most of them, they contain few or more unauthentic hadith. Most of them. There is only one common method of offering salah. As our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number 18, hadith number 604, as well as in Sahih Bukhari, volume number nine, hadith 352, the Prophet said, pray as you have seen me praying. When you offer Salah, you should offer Salah as our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, offered Salah and no other way. So where it comes to the major part of the Salah, like where to keep your hands, how to stand in Qiyam, in Ruku, in Sujood, the various postures, all these, there is only one style, only one method, which is mentioned and given in the Sahih Hadith if you refer to them. There are a few options which a person has. For example, what you recite in Ruku. The Hadith says that sometimes the Prophet recited Subhan Rabbi Azim, that glory be to Allah who is supreme. Sometimes he recited Subhan Rabbi Azim of Hamdika, that glory be to Allah who is supreme and praise be to Him. So there are a few duas, various different duas which the Prophet recited in Ruku, in Sujood, where a person has an option. For example, I told in Vitar, you have to offer all rakat, that is the commandment. Sometimes Prophet offered one, sometimes five, sometimes seven, most of the time three rakat. So there are options in certain things, mainly in recitation, in ruku, in sujood, etc. But the major part, the posture, how you stand, how do you sit, how do you bow, how do you prostrate, everything is only one common method. 
which is given in the Sahih Hadith. The best book that I can recommend, which is available, and which is very concise, small book, and which contains authentic Hadith, is the book, The Guide to Salah, by M.A. Saqib. If people have more time, and they want to read a bigger book, a book which gives more minute details, how do you go for sujood? What part of the body you touch first? How do you get up all the minute details? You can refer to the book, The Prayer of the Prophet. From the beginning to the end, as if you see it, by Sheikh Muhammad Nasiruddin Al-Albani. Sheikh Albani. It gives the quotation of Sai Hadith, etc. You can refer to this book. But as the question is, that after the few recitation, the major part of Salah is only one type. And if you want to read these books, you can refer to the library of the Islamic Research Foundation where these books are available. My name is Jagwinder Sidhu. I don't have an Islamic background. But even my question is not exactly concerned with Salah. Can I ask that? Uh, we'll allow you questions on the topic or connected to the topic. Completely. But I actually have been looking for people to ask this question. I have not been okay. able to as, get this As an exception, because you have been that's why, that's why I came. on your interest, we would uh, allow you a question. Oh, that actually two. Yes. Oh, we'll allow you one question. <laughs> <sir. laughs> we made one exception. Don't let us make <laughs> Okay. The basic question which, which I have been asking, I met a couple of uh, my Muslim friends and also I went to Muhammad Ali Road and asked some Imams also. I, as far as I know, the meanings of Alif, Lam, Meem or uh, Tasen or Ha, Meem, all these are, have not been expounded by the Prophet. Or have they been told to the nearer disciples? Or is it just not known or is it not just not told? Or is it, no, nobody knows? What is it? It's a basic thing because it starts from there. The Quran basically starts from there. Alif, Lam, Meem and then everything starts. The brother has asked a question and he has asked to many Imams and many Muslims didn't get the answer that what is the meaning of Alif Lam Meem, these abbreviated letters. For the complete detail, I think the answer is given in one of my cassettes. It is given there in detail. But since you have asked the question, I will just give in brief that these are abbreviated letters which come in the beginning of certain surahs. It is there in the beginning of 29 surahs. Even the Arabic alphabets, if you count, Alif, Ba, Ta, Sa, along with Ha, there are 29 Arabic letters. And in the beginning of 29 surahs, you find that these letters come. Sometimes a single Saud, Noon, Qaf, sometimes in twos, Ha, Meem, Ta, Sin, sometimes in three letters, Alif, Lam, Meem, sometimes in four, sometimes in five. There are various books written on the subject, volumes and volumes of books. Now what does it mean? Some people say that it is a short form of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people. Some people said that it is the signature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people say that it is used for rhyming. Some people say that Archangel Gabriel used it to attract the attention of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who used it to attract the attention of the people who read the Quran. Various, various, hundreds will find. But the most authentic and the correct is that these abbreviated letters, actually, if you analyze, they come in the beginning of various surahs, is a challenge to humanity. There's a verse in the Holy Quran, several times the Holy Quran says, it gives a challenge to humanity, that try and produce a Quran, a work like the Holy Quran. In Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 88, even if jinn and men got together, they will not be able to produce a recital like the Quran. The Holy Quran says in Surah Tur, chapter 52, verse 34, that you will not be able to produce a work like the Quran. In Surah Hud, chapter 11, verse number 13, it says that if you are in doubt, try and produce 10 surahs like the Holy Quran. In, in Surah Yunus, chapter 10, verse 38, it says try and produce a surah like the Quran. And the challenge gets simpler and simpler. And the final challenge is given in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, which says, mimma nazdalna ala abdina. And if you are in doubt, as what we have revealed to our servant from time to time, Fatu bi suratim 
then try and produce a surah somewhat similar to it. Wad ushwada kuminun the law in kuntum sadikin and call forth your helpers and witnesses if there is any besides Allah. If your doubts are but true, failam tafalu and if you cannot, walan tafalu and of a surety you cannot. Fatta kunnar alati wakudu hanna tawali jara oddatil kafirin. Then fear the fire whose fuel shall be men and stone which is prepared for those who reject faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the challenge to the human beings to try and produce a work like the Holy Quran. So Allah when He says Alif Lam Meem, Ha Meem, Ya Teen, Ta Teen, He is giving an indication to the Arabs. The Quran was revealed in Arabia, so it had to be in Arabic language and the local language of the people out there was Arabic. So Allah indirectly is telling that you people, Arabic is your language. So how you say A, B, C, D, English? Same way, Alif, Lam, Mim, it's your language. With these letters, which you are so proud of. Because when the Quran was revealed, the Arabs were very proud of their language. Arabic was at its zenith, at its peak. The thing that the Arabs were most proud of was their language. It was the age of literature and poetry. They were excellent in literature and poetry. So Allah says that these are your letters. With your letters, which you are so proud of, I have produced this holy Quran. He challenges all the human beings. If they want, they can take the help of jinn also. Anyone besides Allah to try and produce a single surah like the holy Quran. Certain surah of the holy Quran are very small, three verses. And the shortest contain ten words. So Allah is challenging them that try and produce a surah somewhat similar to the holy Quran. So when Allah says Alif, Lam, Meem, Ha, Meem, after this, Wherever you read, whenever it occurs in the Holy Quran, after that immediately there is a praise of Holy Quran. For example, in Surah Baqarah, as you said, starting of the Quran, not starting of the Quran, starting of Surah Baqarah. It says, Alif Lam Meem, Zalikar Kitab Al Araibusi. That Alif Lam Meem, this is a book in which there is guidance without doubt for all those who have faith, all who have taqwa, who have iman. So whenever these abbreviated letters come, after that immediately there is praising of the Holy Quran. So whenever these letters are occurring in the Holy Quran, it's a reminder to the human being that this is Allah's Kalam and reminder for the challenge that try and produce a work like the Holy Quran, you will not be able to do it. No one has been able to do it so far. Many people tried. Many non-Muslims tried but they failed miserably. No one has been able to do it and no one inshallah will be ever be able to do it till eternity. Uh, considering that uh, Brother Mahindra Siddhu had asked this question out of the topic, I would like to remind our audience, today is the topic on Salah, the programming towards righteousness. Kindly restrain your questions to this topic. What I would request is, we have got various videotapes of Dr. Zakir available at the Islamic Research Foundation where you could view it or they are available for purchase outside for rupees 175 each at a subsidized price. We have him speaking on various topics like Quran and modern science, conflict or conciliation, symposium on religion in the right perspective, concept of God in Hinduism, Christianity and Islam, women's rights in Islam, modernizing or outdated, the press debate on is religious fundamentalism a stumbling block to the freedom of expression organized by the Bombay Union of Journalists, Focus of Islam and Universal Brotherhood is the Quran God's Word. Muhammad, peace be on him, in the various world religious scriptures, Dawa or destruction, Al Quran, should it be read with understanding, similarities between Islam and Christianity, Islam, medical science and dietary laws, Islam and secularism, tolerance or intolerance, TV talks on third world broadcasting, New York. Islam, the universal religion and other topics. Any topic would be of interest. You could uh, avail the opportunity to view them at the IRF or if you would like a personal copy, the videotapes are available outside at rupees 175 each. Some are displayed on the table. We also have the Holy Quran with the English translation available for a hadiyah of rupees 150 only. The question from the slip. Why is the method of performing Salah for man and woman different?
the question posed was that why is the method for performing salah of man and woman different? As I mentioned, there are several books available in the market describing the method of offering salah. And most of them have separate chapters of how a woman should perform salah and how a man should offer salah and the posters are different. In fact, there is not a single authentic hadith which says that the woman should offer salah different than the men. There is not a single authentic hadith. In fact, if you read Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of characteristics of salah, chapter number 63, Umma Abdarda, may Allah be pleased with her, she sat in tashahud, like the men, and she was a woman well versed in religious affairs. There are several hadith narrated by Hazrat Aisha, by the other wives of the Prophet, and other lady companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, mentioned Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim and various Sahih Hadith, but none of them say that there is a particular different method and different posters for a man and woman to offer Salah. The answer is very clearly given, as I mentioned earlier, in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 1, in the book of Adan, chapter number 18, Hadith number 604, and Sahih Bukhari, volume number 9, Hadith number 352, the Prophet said, Pray as you have seen me praying. So the men and women should offer salah in the same postures and same way. Hope that answers the question. Assalamualaikum brother. My question is, is it necessary to offer salah only? Can't we pray to Allah in our own way? And will it be accepted by Allah? And did the earlier prophets pray like how we do? And did they pray five times a day? The brother asked the question that should we offer the salah in the same way as told in the Quran and the Hadith, can we offer in our own way and did the earlier prophet offer in the same way as this salah? Regarding the second part of the question, all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offered salah and all of them at least did the sujood, the main part of salah. But all the prophets may not have offered exactly the same way as we offer today. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 3, On this day have I completed a religion for you, and I have completed my favor on you, and I have chosen for you Islam. After the Quran was revealed, the whole deen was made complete. Before that, the prophets did offer salah, they did do sujood, but everything else was not in the same form, maybe somewhat similar. As I give examples, what mentioned in the Bible, etc. Somewhat similar, but may not be the exact form. Regarding the first part of the question, that can we offer in any way like we want? Why should we offer in the same way? I gave you the reasons why we offer Salah the way we offer Salah. There are social benefits. The increase of brotherhood is there. Unity is there. Equality is there. If you say, okay, I want to offer in my house only, sitting on the chair. All these benefits you will not derive. Social equality, brotherhood, love between the human beings, the spiritual benefits, and where is benefit? The full talk which I gave, major part of it contained the benefits. If you open your style, you will not derive all these benefits. And this is the way taught to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet. If you think you are better than the Prophet, you can try it, but you will fail. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 54, Makru makra Allahu wallahu khairul makreen. The unbelievers plotted and planned. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planners. So Allah has shown you the way, this is the best. If you think you are better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and want to improve on him, you can try it, you will fail. If Allah gives the challenge, try and produce a surah better than the Quran. People have tried, they have failed. So if anyone thinks he is better than Allah and the Prophet, is as good as Kof. That's why the unbelievers, they pray the way they pray. But anyone who has faith in the Holy Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet, they will only follow the way showed by the Prophet as the Holy Quran says, Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul. Hope that answers the question. The next question is from Brother Ridwan A. Hamid Khatib. Assalamu alaikum. I work in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Once I called a Muslim Filipino friend of mine for Salah. He said, I have offered Salah in Holy Kaaba many times. And one prayer in Holy Kaaba is equal to one lakh times. 
Therefore, there is no need for me to offer salah for the next few years. <laughs> How shall I answer him? So I asked the question that when he was in Saudi Arabia, one of his Filipino friends, when he called him for salah, he said that he had offered salah in the Masjid al-Haram in Makkah and it's equivalent to one lakh times, hundred thousand times. Therefore, I need not offer for a couple of years. Part of his statement was right that there are Sai Hadith in which the Prophet said that offering Salah in Masjid Nabwi, the Prophet's mosque in Medina, is equivalent to ten thousand times better than any other mosque except the Holy Mosque in Makkah. And if anyone offers Salah in the Holy Mosque in Makkah, it is equivalent to a hundred thousand times of prayer offers in any other mosque. This is a Sahih Hadith and I agree with it. But people have failed to understand its context. These sawabs that you get are the additional sawabs which you get. It doesn't substitute for any of your other fards of Salah. The Prophet didn't say that if you offer one Fajr Salah is equal to hundred thousand Fajr Salah offered somewhere. No. In sawab, in getting blessings you will get one hundred thousand times. That does not mean that you can miss 100,000 Fajr in your life. That doesn't mean that. And to give you an example for a better understanding, how when we appear for examination, you know we have that you get bonus marks. If you play cricket, you get five marks extra. So those people who want admission in medical college, engineering colleges, they have a few marks reserved for NCC, for sports, for badminton, for football. If you take part in intercollegiate cricket match, football match, you get those additional three or four, four or five months. But if someone says, this is helpful if you want admission in a medical college where you get 95 percent marks. If you get 94 and a half, these few marks is helpful for you to get admission in a medical college. But if someone says, I will only play cricket throughout the day, throughout the year, throughout my life, and five, 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 five marks extra. I will get 100 marks and then get admission to a medical college. Do you think you will get? He plays cricket day and night. Night cricket, day cricket. Full day, full night, full year. 10 years. And then he goes to the exam and says, See, I have played so much cricket. See, this cricket match is bonus marks. That okay, besides the main examination, you are getting additional marks for doing something else. So these, they, you will get sawab, you will get blessings. But these blessings don't substitute the faraiz which you have to do. It only comes into consideration when you have offered the fard. These are bonus marks. So if a person offers a salah in Masjid al Haram or Masjid al Nabi, he will get multiple times sawab, but it will not substitute for the fard salah he has to offer every day throughout his life. Hope that answers the question. I am Mr. Mahesh Mehta. Uh, uh, I am a businessman. So people who are going in a mosque here in India, it is compulsory to wear a mosque uh, cap. But uh, in Iran and Morocco, the people who are going in the mosque, they are not wearing the cap or the, they are not covering their head. Why? The brother asked the question that in India, people normally wear the cap when they go to the mosque. But when he went to Iran and Morocco, etc., people don't wear the cap when they offer salah. Brother, there is no verse in the Holy Quran or the authentic hadith which says that wearing a cap is fard, is compulsory for offering salah. No way to say. But there are some hadiths which say that the sahaba did cover the head always. So in that way, if a person covers the head for respect, alhamdulillah. Because if you analyze that in the Eastern culture, in the Eastern culture, for respect, we wear the cap. If you go to England, they say, hello ma'am, and they take out the cap. Hello ma'am, how are you? So take out the cap. That culture is taking out the cap for respect. Eastern culture is wearing the cap for respect. But we Muslims, we don't follow any culture of England or this. Because it's a sign of respect. And there are hadith saying that sahabas, they always covered the head. Not with a cap, sometimes with a cloth, if you go to Saudi Arabia, etc. But there's no hadith or Quranic verse which says, it is fun to wear a cap. So for Muslim, Offer salah without a cap, inshallah, even that salah will be accepted. It's not a fard. 
But if someone says wearing a cap is wrong, even then I don't agree. If someone wears to wear a cap, because no Adi says that if you wear a cap, your salah will not be accepted. So it's optional. So those people who want to wear a cap, wear. Those who don't want to wear, don't wear. Hope that answers the question. Next question from the slip. Can a non-Muslim participate in or offer salah? Uh, this is from B.S. Jain, computer professional. The brother has posed the question that can a non-Muslim participate in offering salah? Brother, if he really truly wants to participate in a salah, but natural first he'll have to have iman. So a non-Muslim who wants to accept Islam, ahlan wa sahlan, he's most welcome. Most welcome. Your salah will only be accepted if you do it with humility and attentiveness. If you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a non-Muslim can accept Islam and offer salah. But if he says, no, I don't believe in Allah, I just want to do what you are doing. He can come and do, but it will be just like another form of gymnastics for him. Because without Iman, without Iman, Salah is useless. Who are you praying to? So if a non-Muslim accepts Islam and then offers Salah, Alhamdulillah it will be accepted. If he doesn't believe in Allah, just for namesake, to show to the people as the Holy Quran says in Surah Mount, woe to the worshippers who only pray to be seen of men. And in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 142, that the hypocrites, they stand for prayer but not in earnestness. And little do they have Allah in remembrance. So Quran speaks about munafiks, which are but natural non-Muslims. So Non-Muslims can pray, but it will not guide them toward righteousness. They are munafiks, they are hypocrites. So hypocrite wants to pray, he can pray, it's only a show for the human being. But if someone accepts Islam and believes Allah is one and only, and he wants to give him thanks and offer salah, he's most welcome. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum brother. Can I, can I ask a question? Can we offer salah in the house of a non-Muslim? The sister posed the question that can we offer salah in the house of a non-Muslim? Sister, as I said earlier, our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter 56, hadith number 429 that the whole earth has been made for me and my followers as a place to offer salah, as a masjid. You can offer salah anywhere in the world, but it should be clean. And there are certain conditions, like if you want to offer salah in non-Muslim you can offer, see to it that it's a clean place, or take a clean cloth and pray on it. See to it in front of you, there's nothing to distract you like an idol or like a photograph. You should have a sutra, as the beloved prophet said. Or you can leave some space from the wall. I have a sutra. A sutra can, can also be a spear. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. can also be a spear. So if you fulfill the conditions of salah, you can very well offer in the house. As long as the place is clean and in front of you there is no photograph or idol, etc. Hope that answers the question. The next question on the slip is, which is the most suitable dress for offering salah? Kurta, pyjama, pant, shirt, tie. Uh, and some other scribbled etc. items are there. Khurshi De Khan, lecturer. So we have the question that which is the most suitable dress for offering salah, kurta, pyjama, band, shirt, etc. The minimum requirement, the part that should be covered for a woman is the complete body except the face and the hand up to the wrist. It should be loose, it should not be tied, it should not be transparent, all these characters of hijab. For a man, it's from navel to the knee, minimum. Minimum. Otherwise, more part of the body is covered, it's preferable. Regarding which is better, kurta, pyjama, or a pants or tie. As long as you fulfill the criteria, the minimum criteria of the salah, which is mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, whichever is comfortable for you can wear. If I ask a Westerner to wear kurta, pyjama, he'll be uncomfortable. So while praying, he'll be shifting here and there. If you ask a villager to wear a coat and tie, he's not comfortable, so he'll be like that, like that. So as long as you fulfill the minimum criteria as mentioned in the hadith, very well you can wear any clothes. It should not go against the sharia. If it's within the clothes of the sharia, you can wear that. If it's not, for example, wearing a cross, you cannot wear those things which resemble that of the unbeliever. You can't pray wearing a cross, that's haram. But if it doesn't fall in anything haram, fulfill all the condition, 
whether you wear kurta, whether you wear shirt, whether you pant, whichever you are comfortable in, you can wear that dress. Hope that answers the question. Assalamualaikum. I am. My name is Maulik Chandarana, and I am a non-Muslim. And I would like to ask you a question. What? What is the difference between the salah and the other prayers offered by other religions, the pujas and the masses? And is there anything wrong with the other ways of prayers other than salah? Very good. Very good. <coughs> the question posed by the brother is that what is the difference in offering salah the way Muslims pray and the prayer offered by non-Muslims like puja etc. What is the difference? But the major difference is that when we offer salah, we offer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is Almighty God. And we believe in a concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I discussed in the lecture which I had given in Billah Matushri, the concept of Almighty God. In other religions, what they worship, what they call God Almighty, we don't consider it to be Almighty God. For example, if a person does idol worship. What we consider that the idol they are worshipping is not Almighty God. The idol they are worshipping is not Almighty God. And if you read the scriptures also, the Hindu scriptures, it is against idol worship. So what we as a Muslim should do, as the Holy Quran says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bainina bainakum. Come to common terms as we not send you. So if I am speaking to a Hindu and if he says, what puja I am doing in front of the idol, is it right or wrong? So I will tell him, if you read, the Yajur Ved, chapter 32, verse number 3 says, Na ta sepati ma asti. Of that God, you cannot make any image. So what you are doing is wrong. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verses 19 to 23, that all those who are materialistic people, they worship demigods, false gods. All those who worship false gods, yet I will fulfill the desires. All those who worship the false god, demigods, I fulfill the desires. Whoever worship the false god will go to the kingdom of false god. Whoever worship me, the true god, they will come to me. So I, as a Muslim, will educate the non-Muslims that what you are doing, I am not talking about the Quran. It is even wrong according to your scriptures. According to your scriptures also, the way of worshipping is wrong. If I speak to a Christian, he doesn't pray the way it has been taught in the Bible. The Bible says, as I mentioned in my talk, all the prophets, when they worship the Hindu sujood, before praying they wash themselves. Moses washed, Aaron washed, may peace be upon them all. They did the sujood. But today when the Christians worship, they don't wash themselves. They don't do the sujood. So first I will tell them what they are not following according to their scripture which is correct. After that I will tell that this is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and shows you the best way of offering salah. And there are people who give counter argument that why do they do idol worship etc. which has been discussed in my earlier lecture concept of God in the major world religion. You can refer to that cassette for the complete answer. Hope that answers the question. Next question from Tanzim M. Khatib, student of standard 8. As you said, namaz should be said shoulder to shoulder. Should women also do the same? So Buddha asked the question, as I mentioned the hadith that our beloved Prophet said, when you stand for salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. Should the women also do the same? As I mentioned that women are allowed in the mosque. But if you say that man and woman will stand shoulder to shoulder, that's not true. Because medical science tells us today that the woman, it has got one degree higher temperature. You will feel soft, you will concentrate more on her than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> so when men and men stand, they stand shoulder to shoulder. When women and women stand, they stand shoulder to shoulder. But there should be segregation of the sexes. And all the other criteria of salah is the same for men and women, but they should be equal and separate facilities. Hope that answers the question. If you have any further questions on this subject or on Islam and comparative religion, you are most welcome to attend our lectures followed by question and answer sessions every Saturday at 3 p.m., every Sunday at 10.30 a.m., and every Monday for ladies at 3 p.m., at the Islamic Research Foundation Auditorium. The last question for the day. Assalamu alaikum brother. I, uh, as you said that ladies are allowed to pray in the masjid, alhamdulillah. 
but I wanted to ask you because Ramzan Sharif is coming and we want to derive the best benefits of it. So suppose like the, after Isha, we can't go due to some family problems or reasons to the masjid. So if we pray after Isha 20 rakat nafil, that we can't offer the Quran with the namaz. So is it the same sabab or should we try to go to the masjid if it's better? This so was the question that when Ramadan is approaching and offering Tarawi after Isha due to family problems they can't go to the mosque and Alhamdulillah there are quite a few places nowadays in Bombay itself which have Tarawi for the ladies Alhamdulillah you can inquire which the places are there there are many Alhamdulillah but if you can't go can you offer at home yes sister you can preferable is congregation but if they not offer congregation due to certain reasons you can offer individually regarding is the sawab same but natural there you get more guidance to hear the recitation of the whole Quran and if you are not half the Quran but natural you will not be able to recite the full Quran in the Tarawi but offering at home is better than not offering at all regarding sawab will be saying but natural congregation sawab according to our beloved prophet mission Sai Bukhari volume number one you get 25 times more sawab or 27 times more sawab so in congregation you get much more sawab than then offering a salah individually. Hope that answers the question. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this program possible. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I thank all our guests, including the press, for attending the program. We also appreciate and thank all the persons involved in the organizing and recording of this event for their dedicated efforts in the success of this program. Jazakumullah khairan.